I'm, I'm glad to be here tonight again. I'm Gerald Jarman. I'm thankful for connecting here with Camp Hill High School. Um, thank you know Jake. I don't know he's probably Mister to a lot of you, um, and the principal and everyone staff for you know bringing me here tonight. I have a little familiarity with the school. There's a, there's several players throughout the years that I've trained uh, who are who are you know part of the Camp Hill School District. So a little familiarity. I know a couple coaches that have been here throughout the years. So that's my little connection with you guys here. But I live. In Harrisburg, I moved up here in 98, so I've been up here for a little bit of time, and I'm just excited to, to stand before you and share some things that I think can benefit you. Let me do this. Stand up if you are a student athlete, middle school, high school, I just want to see. Okay, perfect. Thank you for standing. Have your seat now. Now, stand, stand up if you are a parent of one of those that just stood up. If you're a parent, you're a parent. Okay, great. You can have your seat. I wanted to do that because, you know, it's one thing to, to speak to the, the athletes. It's another thing to highlight the parents. And I want to start there because I was blessed to have a mom and a dad that nurtured me, knocked me upside my head sometimes, kept me in line, you know, as a toddler and coming up, you know, so I just want to acknowledge that, you know, to the parents and to everybody because you can't put a price tag on it. And, and God rest their soul, my mom and dad are no longer with us, um, but their influence still lives on through my life today. They're still living their life through me. And I just wanted to highlight that because everything we want to share is really things that they implemented in my life from knee high up. You know, and we live in an age now where, you know, kids don't want to listen to parents. You know, the parents is cramping their style. You know, you don't want to pay attention. You know, and they kind of want to have their own mindset. But I want to say, those that are sitting here today, you need to make sure tonight you thank your mom or your dad, your guardian, whoever it is, for being there for you. Okay? Because it's, you can't put a price tag on this. Is, that is so, so important. And again, since I was knee high, you know, my parents are there for me. I know there's other parents here who have student athletes who have already been through college. Um, and I'm sure they can speak to that too. But there are a lot of things, again, that they instilled in me since I was knee high. One of those things is the importance, and I'm going to share three P's, okay? Three P's. The first one is preparation. Everybody say preparation. 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 Okay. The first P is preparation. So that is so important in terms of where you're going and how you're going to get there. Okay, who's in middle school? Raise your hand if you're in middle school. Okay, everybody here is high school. Great, so I'm speaking to high school audience. So, if you're in high school, right now, it's important for you to obviously do well in school. You hear that all the time. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a given. Do well in school. Academics, okay? I want to talk to you about some other things as far as preparation, okay? One of the things that I learned, okay, and my dad was my first mentor. I played for some great coaches, college basketball, Dick Tarrant, University of Richmond. I went to a prep school. Uh, my, my prep school was second in the country, Fort Union Military Academy of Virginia. We were second behind Oak Hill Academy. We went 29 to one, I had one loss. Great coach. I played for some great coaches, some great minds, but my dad was my first mentor. He was my first coach, okay? And one of the things he instilled in me at a young age was the importance and, and the discipline of training and practicing and developing a work ethic, okay? Developing a work ethic. 
That's important. The same work ethic work that I had when I was knee high was the same one I had in college. So there were certain disciplines that they instilled in me. So preparation, discipline with your training habits. Because the habits you develop will become a part of you. So the habits, you, the lack of habits will be a part of you too. So it's important to put in the time. And at some point, it has to come from you. It can't always be mom and dad telling you to go out and practice. It can't always, at some point, you have to graduate from that and you have to own it yourself. Now it happens for, for, for players, student athletes, it happens at different stages. Some get that really young. Some they don't, they don't ever get it. <laughs> You know, but you have to own, you have to own it. All right, so at some point I graduated from my dad pushing me, go outside and practice, go outside and do this. Why don't you, at some point I had to want it. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to share. Prepar the first P is what? Preparation. Preparation. Okay, the second P is, drum roll please. late over there. <laughs> Second P is practice. So the first P is preparation. Second P, second P is practice. And it's connected to preparation. Okay? Practice, practice, practice. Okay? Now, it's not just good enough the time you put in, it's the quality. So here's what I mean by that. You can practice for three hours and do a lot of different things and I can be more productive if I, if I practice one hour and it's more intentional. I'll say, it, I'll say it a different way. Practice with a purpose. What's, what sports we got here? Um, what sport do you play? Oh. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Okay. Okay. Good. What about you? Soccer? Okay. Um, uh, baseball. Baseball. Okay. Soccer. I played soccer for like six years. I love soccer. It was my actually my second favorite sport behind basketball. Obviously, um, I played soccer until I got to high school. I couldn't. Once I played for my middle school team, once I got to ninth grade, it was hard to balance basketball and soccer because bat soccer's in the fall, and my high school coach, my high school basketball coach, was so upset with me that I was playing soccer, so I had to give it up. And he wanted me to focus on basketball. He wanted me to focus on coming over gyms in October, you know, and, and preparing. So I, I gave up soccer. It was hard, but I gave up soccer. So played baseball for two, you said baseball, right? Played baseball for two years. Um, second year I made the all-star team, and then I quit after that. Baseball just, it just wasn't enough action for me, a lot of standing around. That, that, that's just me, you know? What was this you play? Uh, catcher, pitcher, third. Oh, you get a lot of action. Yeah. You the catcher? Yeah. Yeah, you get okay. You, I was my first year. I was in the outfield, and second year I moved into first base, and then I was first string first baseman. I was third string pitcher. So, what was other sports? Track, track. You say track and field? Right here. Okay. Right here. Okay, track and field. Yeah, I, I ran track for three or four years. I was a sprinter. I hated running long distance. Um, cross country was not for me. Um, forty yard, you know, forty yard dash. I, I run a hundred. You know, I, I was good at that, but anything long distance just wasn't my cup of tea. So, I mean, I could do it, but my time was not good at all. Anyway. So anyway, so I, I wanted to kind of see who, who was here, what, what sports, your practice. Practice and be intentional. In other words, when you go to practice, make sure you have what you want to cover, what you want to do, things you want to work on, okay? Rather than just going and just doing anything. Because you can go and do anything for three hours and not really get a lot, of, a lot out of it. Versus I can go and be intentional and have my practice schedule mapped out for one hour and get more out of it than you do. All right, so I'm just giving you guys some nuggets. These are things I learned.
throughout the years. The third P is, what's the second P? Passion. Okay, you guys are good audience. So the third P is passion, okay? Passion. Now this one here, this one here is the engine. All right, this is the engine. This is the one that drives everything else. Okay, because your passion will take you places and your passion will give you something that other things can't. See, I was so motivated. You know, you're not going to stop me. And there were haters. There were doubters when I was coming up. People hated on me all the time. I had people talking about me, you know, when I was sixth, seventh grade, you know, in my, in my community, in my neighborhood, people down me all the time. And one time we was out practicing. And I like to share stories, real life stories, because I think it has more meaning. I can be abstract and share principles, but it's good so you can hear the stories behind it. You know, because I just didn't wake up and receive a basketball scholarship one day. It took work. It took discipline. It took focus. And it took passion. My senior year in high school, I used to get up. Before, I would get up at 4 in the morning, okay, and get dressed and go to my high school gym. I would beat the custodian there. The lights would still be off in the gym. I would go to the gym, and he would turn the lights on for me, and I would practice until the first period bell rang. Then I would go to class. My high school coach didn't tell me to do that. My dad didn't tell me to do that. I wanted it myself. So that's what I was talking about. You At some point, you have to want it. If you're going to make it, you got to want it. So I would go to the gym, practice, go to have an apple, some fruit, go to first period. I did that for three months before the season started. That's my passion. Despite what people said, despite the naysayers, despite the haters. Actually, this is how I'm built. The more you talk, the more you put fuel in the fire. You know, like everybody, who has a um, fireplace here? Probably most of you have, everybody has a fireplace now. So, you put the logs on. Why do you put the logs on? Why do you put extra logs? Why do you keep doing that? It's fuel, right? So, the logs, you don't throw the logs on and it quenches the fire or it puts out the fire. The logs go on and it actually expands it. Okay, so the haters, the more, they thought they were throwing logs on my fire and it was going to quench my fire. They thought the things they were saying was going to cause me to retreat. But you know what? <laughs> the only thing they were doing was like fanning the flames. That's all they was doing. And then what happened was the same people that talked about me in middle school, ninth grade, tenth grade, they was watching me play on TV in college. My freshman year. University of Richmond, we beat Syracuse in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I was a starter. I wasn't, I just didn't make the team in scholarship. I started as a freshman. Okay. College Park, Maryland, 18,000 people. 18,000 people, the rain is sold out. And the 9:47 game at night. You guys know the NCAA tournament. The, the the first night, the 9:47 10 o'clock game. You the last game of the night. It's games all day. Okay. Um, NC State and Oklahoma State played before. They played the 7:30 game. So it's our time to play 9:47 game. Every network went to our game. You know this is different. The games are shown on different networks all over. You know the country. At 10.30, everybody tuned in to our game. So on CBS, it was on the game. And being in that arena, okay, we had a lot of fans there because we you know we're Richmond and Virginia. You know, our bracket, we played in College Park, Maryland. A lot of fans there. But 18,000 people by the end, by as the second half went on, everybody in the building was cheering for us. Like I'm getting goosebumps. Like it's years later, and I still get goosebumps talking about it. Because this is probably the biggest experience I've ever had when it comes to my career. 
Everybody in the building cheering for us. Because we were on the dog. 15 seed had never beat a number two seed. Never happened. Now, since then, it's happened five, six times, I think. six, Maybe six times. We was the first to do it. Okay? So, big moment. Game's over. So, we get back in our hotel maybe midnight. ESPN is there. Um, Sports Illustrated. Sporting News. You name every... And I, actually, we didn't sleep that night. <laughs> we actually didn't sleep. So the next morning, they're all at our breakfast. And we lost in the second round to Temple, Temple University. But I, I always I tell people, if we had a week to prepare, we, I think we would have beat Temple. Our coach was just that good. I mean, he just had us so prepared. And we were still on cloud nine. So you know in the tournament, you play Thursday, Saturday, Friday, Sunday. So we played Thursday night. We didn't get in until 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Some of us didn't sleep, okay? So Friday, we wake up, we have our brunch, and all the news media is there. You get one hour in the gym. So all the teams throughout the day get one hour, because there's so many teams. So we get one hour. So the one hour was just like a shoot-around. We were done. So that's Friday. So Saturday, we had the early game, the 12-30 game. So to be quite honest, <laughs> we weren't there mentally, so I'm just sharing with you guys. I'm making excuses, but I'm just saying like, we weren't there mentally. Um, so anyway, but I was talking about my passion, okay? I'm not a big guy. I played with my roommate was seven foot. His shoe was size 16 triple E, probably about like this big, literally. I'm usually the smallest guy on my team, but you, but you know what? What you see on the outside I'm 10 times bigger on the inside. Okay, I'm 10 times bigger. And my attitude was, you're not, I'm not going to be denied. So you got to have that grit about you. You got to have that determination that I'm not going to quit. What separated me from everybody else in my school? It was those things. What's the first P? This is the quiz. Come on. What's the second P? Practice. What's the third? Practice. Okay. If you implement these things, okay, this is going to help position you. I don't make any guarantees with people. I work with kids all the time. I train basketball. I don't. I never make any guarantees, but. If you follow this blueprint, you're gonna put yourself in a position, okay, to be successful. And success for you might be different for you, okay? Your success might be different from his. But whatever it is, whatever you choose, whatever your path, okay, this will position you for success. There's many other things, you know, that you can add to it, but I believe this is a good start, you know? And this basketball, I see this basketball here, Hope everybody's alert because I'm going to be passing it. Make sure nobody nobody falls asleep in my sessions. If you catch the ball, just throw it back. Everybody's like this. <laughs> I saw some some people like this. Nobody falls asleep in my session. He caught it one hand. Okay, you a lefty too? Oh, okay. I'm a lefty, so. Kevin Dexter, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I have my book here as well that was mentioned in the onset. How am I on time? I don't know how am I. Okay. So my English, my freshman year in college, all incoming freshmen had to take an English class, so I English 103. All right, um, and you had to pass with a, you had to pass with a satisfactory of a C. If you didn't, you had to take it again. All right, so I see minus is failing the class. So I was into my first first semester, freshman year, and this class was all about writing papers and all this type of stuff, stuff I wasn't used to. Just get past You know, doing research, having your thesis statement, your supporting evidence, all this type of stuff, you know, so. Taking my freshman year, first semester, I got a C minus. 
in pads. All right, so I had to take a second semester freshman year. So I took a second semester. You guys think I pass? Where's your hand think I pass? What? Sweep my hands still down? What? Okay. I failed for the second time. English 103. I'll never forget this. So now I'm hurt now. Like, look, I've never failed a class before in my life. Failed it again. All right, so I had to get a tutor. So after practices, after practice, late at night, I'm going to see my tutor on campus. I had, to, I had to be in a study group. So now going into my sophomore year, I had to take it again. So now you gotta understand, like, I'm taking it with freshmen, incoming freshmen. So guess what? I just played on national television. So all these people know, all these people know me, the freshmen. And now, here it is, I'm sitting in their English class. And they know I'm not a freshman. So my whole image was just shook up. I, I mean, I wasn't, I tried to hide, couldn't hide anyway, but. Um, so I took it, first semester sophomore year. So, how many of you think I passed? <laughs> he said, I hope so, <laughs> for your sake. I see some hands still down. Jump roll, please. I passed. <laughs> now they actually kicked me out. They were like, you can't come back. <laughs> We've seen you enough. <laughs> so I passed. So that was my sophomore year. By the time I was a senior, so, so those classes sparked me to do freelance writing in that process. So by the time I was a senior, I had professors who was asking for my work. And, I'm, and there's a backdrop to this story. There's a point I want to make. Going from failing English, two, failing English class two times to being an author um, is, is a tremendous achievement for me. You know, obviously basketball, you know, my career, you know, many accomplishments, but this one, this one is a major trophy for me because I know where I came from. I know how tough it was because it was, it was out of my element. It was something I wasn't used to. So in this book, there's a chapter that talks about enduring setbacks. Okay? You gotta learn how to endure setbacks. And I, and I counsel parents, I actually counsel parents, kids all the time, those who are going off to college, because what happens is when they get to college, and this is a whole other message, but when they get to college, all of a sudden, first semester, they're struggling. They're away from home. They don't have the, the comforts of family and friends in the community. So when you're home, you got all that support. And you don't, you take it for granted. So then you get to college and now you're on your own. Then you encounter some challenges in the class or in your particular sport. Now you're a freshman and there are seniors on the team and you know they have seniority and you're struggling. All this stuff happened to me. It was, it was rough. Division one college basketball is no joke. Like, so I faced challenges on the court. I faced challenges in the classroom. Division University of Richmond is one of the top. It's one of the most beautiful campuses. How many of y'all know that in the country? But it's also one of the top academic institutions as well. And they don't play. Just because you're an athlete, that doesn't mean you get a ticket to slide through. So it was bumpy at first, real bumpy, my freshman year. And there were times I was on the phone calling back home. And I tell moms this all the time, do not cave in with the first phone call. <laughs> not dads, I tell moms, because they get that call. Moms are already on edge anyway, because my baby is gone. They're already like struggling. Now all of a sudden, Johnny calls home after a few weeks in tears and mom never heard him cry before and she's ready to hop in the car. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Maybe this is the wrong crowd. You guys are good. Y'all know what I'm talking about. She's ready to hop in the car. <laughs> Say no more. I'm, I'm, I'm out. So I tell moms, do not jump at the first 
sign of, <laughs> of uncertainty. Because I called back home after a month and my parents and my support system, nope, you're not going anywhere. Tough it out. This, this is real talk. Again, I like to share stories because it just further, further validates the points or whatever. You're not going anywhere. You're a freshman. Learn how to fight through it. In today's age and culture, if you don't like the coach, if you're not doing well, if you're not playing, you transfer. I mean, the transfer portal, I don't know if you guys know about that, but the transfer portal is, is like as high as it's ever been every year now. Colleges don't even look at high school seniors first now. They go straight to the transfer portal. So the past, since the pandemic, the last two or three years, it's been tough, tougher for high school student athletes to receive a scholarship or go to college because colleges are going to the transfer board. They'd rather take someone who's already in college, who's already a season, as opposed to someone who's a freshman. So, um, but yeah, you're not going anywhere. Man, but the coach, you know, he's, the coach is this, and I never had a coach talk to me like that, and my coach was militant. And I wasn't used to that. I'm used to coaches always loving me and everything I do. And he was militant. He would call you everything but a basketball player. <laughs> and you can't say anything. So I'm just giving you all the real raw talk. It wasn't easy. Now, but I stayed. And I'm going back to the support system. That's what I started with. I had a mom and a dad that had... They loved me, but they were firm, okay? And they trusted in the work that they put in. So I'm thankful for that. I'm very thankful that they didn't allow me to throw the towel in, even though I wanted to. And that's all in this book. Um, yeah, so I have some, there's a couple different um, Places where you can journal. There's a couple questions in the book as well. But I want to end with this. I have some affirmations at the end. I, I, I'm a firm believer, and I'll wrap it up after this year. I know I'm long winded. Um, so I have five affirmations that we're going to say real quick. Okay, here we go. Everybody's going to say this with me. So let me read it first. So these are transition affirmations. Say these powerful statements to yourself daily. All right, the first one is, I am ready and willing to face any challenge with confidence and integrity. All right, so. That means, oh. All right. <laughs> okay, let me say it again. I am ready and willing to face any challenge with confidence and integrity. Y'all ready? On three. One, two, three. I am ready and willing to face any challenge with confidence and integrity. All right, that's the first one. It's only five. They start with I am. That's one of the most powerful statements you can say. Not I was, or not I am going, not, not, that's proper English, I am going to. Not I'm going to. The second one is, I am an overcomer, and my life will be an example to others. All right, on three. One, two, three. I am an overcomer, and my life will be... Not bad, okay? Number three, what's number three? Oh, no, no, that's right. All right. I am a winner and will not give up or quit until I win. On three. One, two, three. I am a winner and will not give up or quit until I win. Number four, I am a believer of my abilities and not a doubter. I am a believer of my abilities and not a doubter. On three. One, two, three. I am a believer of my abilities and not a doubter. All right, last one. Last but not least, I am fully equipped and focused for any task ahead of me. I am fully equipped and focused for any task ahead of me. All right, on three. One, two, three. 
Man, that was weak. Come on. Say it from your chest. Let's try it again. On three. One, two, three. Okay, all right. I said, wait, okay, let me say it again. Let me say it again. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, I was. I am fully equipped and focused for any task ahead of me. All right, on three. One, two, three. Good. Okay. Give yourself a hand. Not bad. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for Q and A. Um, okay. Quick question. Any questions? Hopefully, I have answers. If I don't, I won't. Um, so, anybody have any questions? Naz, Naz, the time. Yes. Right yes. Now. Can you talk a little bit about his, his pathway? Great question. This is my son right here. Okay. Um, he's a junior academically, but he's a sophomore athletically because he gets the COVID year back. Um, point guard at Clarence University, which is in the PSAC. So my son had a, he was obviously he was good as a young player. But he, he, he encountered some challenges himself because, because of who his dad was, okay? So he went through a time period where when he was about nine or 10, where he wasn't himself and he wasn't playing well. And, and I didn't know what it was. I just I couldn't figure it out. I was his AAU coach as well too. So, so he got me as a dad and I was his AAU coach. So anyway, so I, I didn't know what was going on, so I had to talk to him. I was riding in the car one day. He was about 10 years old. I said, gee, what's going on? You know, what's, you don't say on yourself. He said, well, he said, Dad, he said, if I, if I do well, then people say, well, you should. Look who his dad is. So he doesn't, he doesn't get what he deserves because of that. If he doesn't do well, Oh, look at him, like, his dad is even a former college and pro player. Man, that's, if I was him, I would be this. And so, I didn't realize the pressure he was under, okay? And so we had a long talk, and actually, I, I said to him, I said, just so you know, like, you don't have to play basketball if you don't want to. It, from that moment on, it shifted, it shifted everything in his life. I said, I don't want you to play for me. I said, if you don't want to play anymore, that's fine with me. I was not want you to play, but I don't want you to have any pressure. If you do well, you know, I'm still gonna love you. And I had to, I had to be careful with my son and not put extra pressure on him. So, but anyway, you know, came to play. He started as a freshman in high school, and then he, he moved into Scotland, Scotland Academy. Am I familiar with Scotland and Chambersburg? It's a prep school. They just reopened about four years ago. It used to be a military school, but so prep school now. So we went, went there for prep school, played with a really good team, get recruited by some division ones, but they hadn't offered anything. And then Clarence University comes through and the coach, head coach that really loved him, came to see him play a couple times, offered him a scholarship. And his freshman year at Clarence University, he averaged 22 points a game as a freshman. He was 14th in the nation, NCAA scoring. It was only one or two freshmen in the top 20 scoring in the NCAA Division II. That was his first sophomore year, which was last year. He averaged 20 points a game. Um, he was sacking in the piece, sacking, scoring. He's 200 points away from 1,000 now. Um, so, and you can't tell I'm proud, right? <laughs> you can't really tell. Um, was that good enough or anything else? That's good, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I forgot to mention my son here, so he's Gerald Drama the third. I'm the second, he's the third. I asked him, was there gonna be a fourth one day? He's like, I don't know, I've been thinking about that. I said, well, I'm glad you aren't, son. That's good. We'll just leave that, let's just table that for now. <laughs> um, yeah, so great young man. Has a 3.4 GPA, cumulative, which is the most important thing. So great question. 
Next, next question. Let me ask you one here, uh, Gerald. So, yes. um, having gone through the recruiting process yourself when you were a student athlete, and then with your son, um, you know, what, what changes have you seen that you think might be important for our, our student athletes today that have been different for your son than maybe they were for you, and some things that maybe that, that helped them with to, to get seen in, in that world as it is today. Yeah, the landscape has really changed since I've been in school. Um, you know, back when I was in school, there was VHS, um, the tapes, <laughs> you know, you put together like a highlight tape, you know, and you, you mail it, you mail it to the college of your choice. So obviously it was a lot different back then. I'm dating myself now. So, uh, but nowadays, you know, obviously social media, the importance of social media. Um, social media is good and it can be bad. You know, we all know that, you know, social media can be a bad thing too, because I've seen, I've seen student athletes who had a scholarship offer get it revoked because of their social media. I've seen student athletes, colleges pull it off the table because of their Twitter. And who, not just yours, but who you're connected to. Twitter, Snapchat, um, you know, you, you name it. So you gotta be careful. And I, I share this with different audiences all the time. Your know, social media's gotta be right because if a, if a coach, when a, when a college sees you play, okay, nowadays the first thing they do, they go search for you on social media. The first thing they do. Then the next thing, obviously, they contact your school. You know, they want to find out your your grade, stuff like that. Um, but as far as the recruiting and understanding the landscape, you know, you you want to have a you want to have a highlight reel. You want to have something that shows that highlights your talents. But it's not just that nowadays. Because some colleges they want they want an entire game film. You know, so a lot of times, I mean, highlight reels, that's, that's what it is, a highlight. Like, but they don't see when you missed a shot that you walk right down court. <laughs> or they don't see your poor attitude because the coach took you out of the game. So know this, there are times they may ask for an entire game, entire game footage, okay? But yes, yeah, right, yeah. Um, highlight reels, your, your, full, your games, you know, Having a good relationship with your high school coach, you know, that's important too. Um, taking visits, you know, going on visits. I did it with my son, I, you know, I would take him. If there was a college he was interested in, this is what we did, okay? If there, there was, I had him put together the top 10 colleges. This was like maybe his sophomore year. I had him put together, write a list of his top 10 colleges, where he, where he would like to go. And that was a stretch for him because he only could come up with two. <laughs> I want to go here or there. Okay, that's a good start. So it took us some time to develop the list, but he had 10. So what we did was we would, we, we sent each college, we sent like a profile, like um, game footage. You know, he, he sent like his academic profile and a letter. You know, just, and I, we heard back from a couple, a um, couple that were interested, and then for some, they just put him on their radar screen, you know. Um, but yeah, next thing I want to say about recruiting, real quick. Understand this, because a lot of times parents don't understand this. If you get mail from a college, it depends on what the letter says, okay. A, it depends on who wrote it. B, it depends on the, the content of the letter. So if you get if you're getting letters from a school, that might not necessarily mean that they want you. Okay, you could just be a part of a list. So this is stuff I educated my son. Actually, I talk to parents all the time too, because some they might get a letter from someone. Oh, I got an offer. I mean, they're excited because they got a letter from UConn. Let me see the letter. This is the form letter. They send this probably to 100 athletes. Um, so you just gotta know the difference. They're, I could do a whole talk on the recruiting, but so hopefully that was the answer. Did I answer your question? Okay, okay. Um, yes?
Well, I, I made it a point. I made a decision when he was in fourth grade. He was going to play for me. So I, I yeah, yeah. So I coached. I used to be on staff with advanced hoops. How many of you are familiar with advanced hoops? Advanced training. Okay, I used to be on staff with, with advanced training. So my son was in fourth grade because of the. And you can be good, but because of the, the lack of coaching, the lack of, you know what I'm saying? Like, I said, I'm just going to coach him. So I made it, I coached him from fourth grade up until his sophomore year of high school. Because um, I just didn't want him to get involved in the wrong type of coaching, coach only interested in winning, all that kind of stuff. So um, I coached him all the way through. But one thing I did do, kind of to pick it off that question was when he got to a certain age I did pass him along to like certain people I trusted like when he got to eight when he got to eighth grade I knew he was getting to the age where he needed to hear, hear a different voice and I wanted to maintain my father son relationship because a lot of dads who coach their kids what happens is their father son relationship gets muddy because they're always in coach mode like they're coaching them in the in the arena or a football field, then they get in the car around home and the dad is scolding them about something they didn't practice. Now you're home and now it's Johnny is like whatever. Then you coach him in the game, then every practice. So when he got to eighth grade, there were some guys who played locally who were really good. College basketball. I talked to them and they took my son away. They would come and pick him up and play ball. So what it did was it it helped me and my son just maintain our, and I don't know if this is for anybody, I'm just throwing stuff out, you know. Um, but it helped me keep my father's son relationship intact. And I wouldn't even talk about basketball all the time. I would wait for him to bring it up. And then, but now he brings it up, he would bring it up in a way that, Dad, so what do you think about this? Well, this happened, and what do you think? So the dynamics changed, which was a good thing. So I don't know if that helped, but okay. All right, I'll turn it back over. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one more time for Coach Joe.